If the Creator were to appear personally before a group of panelists on this planet, say a special edition of Meet the Press, one of the first questions would almost surely be, Mr. Creator, did Noah's flood really happen? And then the divine guest would also be questioned about the age of the earth, the age of the rocks, and the age of the fossils. And if time should permit, he would likely be asked how long it took him to create this world. Were the seven days of creation week literal days? And what does he think of the evolutionary theory? Well, the Creator has declined a personal appearance on this planet at this time. He has promised one in the very near future. But in the meantime, friend, these questions are very, very relevant. It is written. This is George Vandeman. Today It Is Written presents When God Meets the Press. What does it matter about Noah's flood? What difference does it make whether it happened or whether it didn't? Just this. If the seventh chapter of Genesis, the record of the flood, is accurate, then may not the first chapter of Genesis, the record of creation, be equally reliable? Is one fact and the other legend? Could it be that to reject the flood is also to reject creation and the Creator? I wonder if you see how serious this really is. We can't accept Jesus Christ as Savior and reject Him as Creator, because creation and Calvary are in the same book. And either all of that book is inspired or none of it is inspired. The book is either true or it's untrue. It cannot be both. But there's still more involved. If the record of the flood is true, then one of the basic philosophies of our time is seriously challenged. The philosophy that ascribes great age to our earth. Why? because the lifetime of Noah falls somewhere around 5,000 years ago. And from Noah back to the beginning of our world is only 10 generations, according to the Word of God. Only a step. If Genesis 7 is true, and if Genesis 1 is true, then this world simply cannot be as old as we have been led to believe. Do you see? Could it be that this world is only several thousand years old instead of the multiplied billions that we've been led to believe? Could it be that man is not very good at guessing games? For generations, men have been probing the surface of the earth. They've been honestly trying to discover what happened to it in the distant past, speculating about the age of the earth and the rocks and the fossils you see. It seems that for some reason men find it especially difficult to believe that this earth is as young as the scriptures suggest. Well, the Creator will not be appearing this week on Meet the Press, but He refers us to His published statements found in an ancient book where we can easily discover His views. He thinks that's best at the moment, and He hints that a personal appearance may not be essential right at this time. For he says over here, in, recorded in John verse 47, John 4, 5 verse 47, he says this, But if you do not believe what he, that's Moses, if you do not believe what Moses wrote, how are you to believe what I say? Now, incidentally, it was Moses who wrote both the account of creation and the account of the flood. Now, did Noah's flood really happen? Evidently, Jesus believed it did, for he spoke of Noah's day as a parallel of our own. Let me turn back here to Matthew, the 24th chapter. Matthew, the 24th chapter, and I'm going to read verse 37. Here it is, Matthew 24, 40, 37. Uh, as things were in Noah's days, Jesus is speaking, as things were in Noah's day, 
days, so will they be when the Son of Man comes. That's clear, isn't it? Evidently, he believed in the flood. Now, what about the age of the earth and the rocks? We ask our Creator, and he answers it. The early chapters of Genesis indicate that the earth is only ten generations older than the flood. Now we ask him about the age of the fossils. The scriptures tell us exactly how and when all living things died, and these, of course, are the basis of the fossils. Listen, this is what we read over here in Genesis 7, verses 21 to 23, right back here in the book of beginnings, the seventh chapter, verses 21 to 23. He says, Every living creature that moves on earth perished. Birds, cattle, wild animals, all reptiles, and all mankind. Everything died that had the breath of life in its nostrils. Everything on dry land. God wiped out every living thing that existed on earth. Man and beast, reptile and bird, they were all wiped out over the whole earth. And only Noah and his company in the ark survived. Mighty clear answer, wouldn't you say? And we ask him, how long did it take to create this world? Was it a long, slow process? Listen, God gives us the answer over here in Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. You may want to take these down or ask for the book that we'll be offering at the close of the telecast, and they'll give you these scriptures. The 33rd Psalm, verses 6 to 9, says, The Lord's word made the heaven. All the host of heaven was made at his command, for he spoke and it was done. It was, you see. He commanded and it stood firm. How long did it take God to create this world? It says he spoke and it was. Now, another question. Were the days of creation week literal days? The Genesis record suggests, contains not a suggestion, not a hint, that they were anything but literal, 24-hour days. It specifies that these days had an evening and a morning. We read in Genesis, the first chapter recording creation, the fifth verse, it says, So evening came, and morning came, the first day. See, then verse 8 will come down during the week. Look, verse 8 says, Evening came, and morning came, a second day and so on through the week. Well, another question. What does the Creator think of the evolutionary theory? Did man evolve upward from a lone cell in some primeval ocean? Right there in the first chapter of Genesis, he gives the answer. Verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Evidently, man started at the top, not at the bottom. Do you see how the scriptures answer our questions that have been plaguing us for centuries? And then, for more information, the Creator refers us to his other book. Did you know he has two books? He has the book called the Bible, and the other one's the book of nature. Listen to this, Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 1. Psalm 19. Verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. That's his other volume, spread from sky to sky. And this is what the patriarch Job said. Job 7, Job 12, verses 7 to 9. Job 12, verses 7 to 9. Listen to what he said. One of the first writers in the Bible, listen, one of the oldest writers, but ask the beasts and they will teach you, the birds of the air and they will tell you, or the plants of the earth and they will teach you, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. And then Jesus said in Luke 19, verse 40, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Luke 19, verse 40, he said this. He said, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. But someone is saying, that's just the trouble. Doesn't the book of nature contradict the Bible? 
Don't the stars and the beasts and the rocks tell a story different from that told in the scriptures? Isn't there indisputable evidence in the rocks and the fossils that the earth is very, very old? And my answer is this. It's generally assumed that there is such a contradiction, but could it be that we have been misreading the book of nature, misreading the evidence? Could it just as easily be read another way? For instance, the prime exhibit of the evolutionary philosophy is its geologic timetable. The college student today opens his books to elaborate charts showing the divisions of geologic time. And there he sees the supposedly oldest rocks at the bottom, with those thought to be the youngest at the top. In the bottom rocks are found certain lower forms of life, see, then moving up to the higher forms of life in an apparent progressive series. The eras and the periods all carefully tabulated with estimated dates ranging from 500,000 to 1 million 750,000 years ago for man back to 2 billion years ago for the lowest forms of life. Now such a chart is convincing to the point of being overwhelming. Could Genesis stand a chance against such an array of evidence? Yet we need to understand that these charts are largely hypothetical, a combination of fact and assumption. And sometimes they're built up by a circular reasoning in which, which one assumption supports another assumption. This classroom chart, you see, is made up according to the succession of the fossils that are found in the earth. It is simply assumed. See, since that the theory of evolution must be correct, that the lowest forms of life must belong to the oldest rocks. And evolution, in turn, cites the geologic timetable for its most convincing support. Dating the rocks by the fossils, you see, and then dating the fossils by the rocks. Makes me think of the story of the jeweler who was proud of the fact that his clocks were always right. He checked them every day with the factory whistle. And then one day, the factory manager stopped by. He said, our whistle hasn't been a second off in years. We set our time by the clocks in your window. Is it possible that we too have slipped into a circle of reasoning that proves itself by itself. Has evolution set its time by geology, and geology by biology, by biology, and biology by evolution? It would seem so. But could it be that the order of the fossils may be the result of something other than evolution? Could it be that explained just as well by the violent action of the flood? Might not such an upheaval involving much more than water, have had a sorting action, might it be only natural that certain types of organisms should be buried first? Certainly. And would not the order of burial depend also upon the relative ability of animals to escape the rising waters? The less mobile, smaller creatures would be trapped first, while some of the higher animals, and especially man, would be able to retreat to the highest elevations before being inundated. I don't deny that there's some degree of order in the fossil record. I only question what that order means. Could it be that the fossil record, so intriguing to modern man, is not the record of long ages at all, but rather the record written in the rocks of the terrible events of a single year, the year of the great flood? Have we been misreading the evidence? One of the problems is that in most cases, the assumptions of the men who date the rocks have ruled out both creation and catastrophe, and the rocks are read accordingly. On the other hand, the Genesis account tells us of a special creation, a start of all things, and it describes one great catastrophe in history, one violent discontinuity in the uniform process of, processes of nature the flood of Noah's day. Now, if there was such a creation, and if there was such a flood, can we be so certain that the present is a safe guide to the past? Do you see what I'm saying? For a number of years now, 
quiet but intensive research has been going on that has led certain outstanding responsible scientists to question seriously some of the accepted conclusions about the origin of our Earth. Perhaps the most startling is evidence that suggests that the rocks being studied were not formed through long ages, but within the space of split seconds. Remember the words of Scripture? For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast, Psalm 33, 9. Why then do the rocks look old? Could it be that the whole of uniformitarianism upon this generation, the evident consistency in the processes we see in action today, is blinding us to the fact that uniformity may have been disturbed, and evidently was, on at least two occasions in the past, at creation and at the time of the flood. Shall we suppose then that knowing nothing of the facts of creation, and follow me carefully now, this is fascinating. Knowing nothing of the facts of creation, but with our own background of experience, we wander into the Garden of Eden on that Friday afternoon of creation week, and we meet Adam, strong and tall, a married man. His stature, if nothing else, leads us to immediately conclude that he's at least 20 years of age, maybe 22. Yet we're wrong. He's actually only a few hours old. Now, I do not mean that Adam looks old in the sense of showing any signs of wear and tear. Adam is brand new. There isn't a cell in his body that shows any sign of aging or decay. But here's the point. We immediately judge Adam to be at least 20 years old because in our experience, you see, we have observed that it takes about that long for a human being to pass through the stages of infancy and childhood and adolescence to the stature and perfection of manhood that we now see before us. That's the way we've observed it. We've never seen it any other way. Yet Adam was created just the way we see him. See, with the appearance of age, already in the perfection of full-blown manhood, the processes of development that we're certain would have taken 20 years have been completed in an instant of time. Uniformity has been bypassed. Now we turn to the animals. Again, our eyes, guided by our own experience, tell us that the animals must be several years old at least. But are they? No. Here's a giant redwood in the Garden of Eden. You lumbermen, look at it. You would swear by all your experience that the tree is several hundred years old. Its stature alone tells you that. Yet God made it within the week. It's brand new, no evidence of age or decay. I'm not sure about the rings, for it has lived through no changing seasons. Just a full-grown, perfect tree. Here again, the Creator has speeded up the processes of nature to compress centuries into an instant of time. Evidently, when we're looking at creation, our experience of today is not a safe guide. That's what I'm trying to say. Now we pick up a rock. I'm not going to say that the rocks look old. I'm not going to say that at the moment of creation, God built into the radiogenic uh, marks of decay. But the rock, like man, like the animals, like the trees, like all of God's creation, is in a state of complete development, ready for business. And a scientist stepping into the Garden of Eden with us would stand amazed, absolutely amazed at what he sees. We can only wonder at what God has done. We can only marvel at seeing the work of decades, the work of centuries, the work that it seemed to us must have taken millions or billions of years, compressed into that incredible moment when God spoke and it was done. Do you begin to see what may have happened to our atomic clocks? Do you begin to see the possible difficulties when we try to read them today? God did not build age into the rocks in an attempt to deceive men. See, he simply made the earth and rocks and all in six days, and then told us he did it. Is that deception? Isn't it tragically significant that creation and the flood, the two events that would help to explain the troublesome problems of dating, are routinely bypassed by those who so tirely, tirelessly, and sincerely seek the answers? 
creation, you see, simply does not fit into our experience. We've observed nothing that could give us any idea of what that week was like. And the catastrophe that God released in the days of Noah still further frustrates the effort of man today to read those clocks. As much as we know about floods, destructive as we've observed them to be, there's simply nothing in our experience that can qualify us to understand the flood of Noah's day. Here was not a local inundation, not a minor catastrophe. The entire planet was involved, and it was not the ravages of water alone that left our world as we see it today. The earth was torn and twisted and convulsed in a way that our imagination simply cannot reach. Start with rain. Add cloudbursts, add water gushing forth from the earth, add tidal waves, add fire, add wind, add volcanoes, add twisting and turning, and mountains rising and falling, add the most violent convulsions, the wildest upheavals, add anything you can think of. And still, we cannot begin to appreciate what happened in Noah's day. Not a catastrophe of a moment. Rather, it must have been centuries before the earth quieted down. Centuries in which the principle of uniformity simply was not working. Now, here are some illustrations that we can understand. Watergate, Korea Gate, Patty Hearst and the SLA, and the Kennedy assassination. Within the recent memory of most of us, something happened on a summer night at Chappaquiddick. It happened in our time. But we can only take the word of the participants, for after all, we were not there. You see, here's the point. If with all our powers of investigation, all of the advantages of living while the incident occurred, we cannot even be sure about what happened in these various instances, what are we up against when we try to understand creation? We. You and I simply were not there. And here, you see, was not the incident of an ordinary summer night or a time in Congress. Rather, we're faced by six days in which the Creator Himself, bypassing the laws of uniformity as we know them, created a world. And we confront in Noah's time a violent disruption of nature that lasted not for six days, but probably for centuries. I say, is it any wonder that we're frustrated when we try to read the clocks that ticked in the distant past? How could it be otherwise? I don't claim that all the answers are in. There are uh, questions posed by the study of the rocks that defy simple explanation. But if the surface of this planet in its wild disarray, leaves us confused and uncertain. If the book of nature does not make itself clear, is it not all the more appropriate that we turn to the written revelation, which claims as its source the mind of the Creator God? When we do contradictions once stubborn and confusing, will yield to the profound simplicity of the words that shine into this questioning generation like a star in the night. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Meet the press. Is such an interview necessary? Hasn't God given us the answers in a book that's available to us all? And were he to appear before any panel of questioners, would he tell us anything that would conflict with what he's already told us? No, God will not be appearing on Meet the Press this week, but soon on a cosmic network that will reach every man, woman, and child on this planet is an unparalleled addition of To Tell the Truth. Yes, there are imposters. We talk about them frequently on this telecast, but we don't need to be confused. We don't need to guess about the past or about the future. We don't need to misread the evidences that have, been, have to do with our beginnings, nor do we need to ignore the warnings of a loving God about what He is to come. If we stay close to that book, no matter how many voices counsel us to write it off as outdated, if we stay close to that book, we will not need to be surprised or embarrassed 
in the day not far distant when distant when cosmic thunders dividing time from eternity roll their message from sky to sky will the real creator please stand up shall we pray wonder of wonders the creator god condescends to listen to us pray Loving Lord, God of the heavens and the earth and of a man, as a creature of your making, we yield our minds and hearts to you. We exercise the right of free choice that has been granted us and decide that a loving God deserves our commitment, our loyalty, and our love because he first made us. Thank you, Lord. It's in your name that we ask it. Amen. I'm Lonnie Meloshenko. Are you a doubting Thomas? You'd like to believe if you could. At least you're willing to listen and you rather like what you've heard today. You wouldn't mind listening to more of the same. If any of that fits you, then you'll want the book that we're offering today as our gift. It's Pastor Vandeman's book, Tying Down the Sun. We'll tell you in just a few moments where to phone or write for your free copy. Tying Down the Sun is filled with solid but very readable materials such as you've heard today. And there's so much more, thrilling evidence that there is a creator, that the flood of Noah's day really happened, and that the Bible is what it claimed to be, the inspired word of God. There isn't a dull page in this book, so why not make your request right now before you forget, ask for the book by name, Tying Down the Sun, and we'll put it into the mail right away. And now here is the information you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. The offer is sent by mail free and postpaid. Our address is easy to remember. Just It Is Written, Box O, that's Box Zero, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please be sure to ask for the offer by name. While you're writing down the address, let me remind you to invite a friend to watch It Is Written with you next week on this station. The address again is It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please mention the offer by name and write It Is Written, Box O, that's simply Box Zero, Thousand Oaks, California, and the zip is 91360. And now the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. <laughs>